I listen to every album by The Pillows. Did you know they have 22 of them? And that's not counting the FLCL soundtracks or the compilations or the EPs or anything. They have 22 studio albums released in the 27 years between 1991 and 2018. You can split The Pillows albums up into several different periods, and the first one starts with their 1991 album Moon Gold. It's their first album, and it kind of sucks. The Pillows simply have not developed their alt-rock sound yet. If you've only heard the FLCL soundtracks and then you put this on with no context, you would be really confused. Which probably happened to at least a few people because this was one of two Pillows albums on American Spotify for years. Onto the actual contents of the album, and as I said, it's not good. This is a really generic, bland, jangle pop album. There's no standout tracks, there's nothing to separate the Pillows from the 4,000 other bands that sound exactly like this, and there's absolutely zero signs of what they would become later on down the line. It's interesting to see how they sounded at the start, but there's no other reason to check this out. It's inoffensive and mildly pleasant to listen to, but doesn't stand out at all. I'm going to introduce something for this video that I'm calling the Good Song Index. This is just how many good songs are on an album, but I want to give it a fancy name so I sound professional. By good songs, I mean something I enjoy enough to want to revisit and come back to later. Something that gives me a reason to listen to the album again. Where does this album rank on the Good Song Index? Oh. That's not good. Don't worry, it only goes up from here. Moving on to their second album, 1992's White Incarnation. This is just moon gold, except very slightly better. With such classics as Tonight and Good Night, this is just bland, uninspired jangle pop, just like moon gold. You can take everything I said about that album and apply it to this one. This one does have one thing that makes it the better album, though, and that's that it has the pillow's first actual good song. Paper Moon Nikoshi Kakete is good. I enjoy listening to it, I've come back to it, it's a good song. There's still 1 out of 11, but that's an improvement. Moving on to 1994's Cool Spice, the Pillows are finally evolving. Into alt rock? Nope. Into jazz? Hell yeah. The Pillows decide being a jangle pop band is boring and get some personality, becoming a sophisticated jazz pop band instead. Considering this is their shortest album at just under 30 minutes long, it's really inconsistent in terms of quality. Monochrome Lovers is a really fun tropical jam. This album quickly progresses to track 3, which is boring and sucky and not fun at all. It's just a weird album in general because it sounds nothing like anything else in their entire discography. They introduce some tropical, jazz, sophista pop elements, and it kinda works. Sometimes. One out of seven in terms of good songs. Now we move on to their first album and the last of their first little era, 1995's Living Field. This album sees the Pillows take some of their jazz and sophista pop elements from Cool Spice and add on to them, along with finally developing some kind of rock sound at points. The songs on this are simply better than Cool Spice. They're written better, they're more catchy, and the hooks are just much improved. It's just a general improvement on Cool Spice all around. They also start going in a rock direction on certain songs, including the best song here, The Killing Field. Yes, the best song on an album called Living Field is called Killing Field. It's funky, and it kind of reminds me of Stalker from their next album. There's also a couple dream pop touches here and there that are not present on any other Pillows album, like on the track Something Like a Romance. There's even some Shibuya K on tracks such as Sunday. This is the album where I think they really stepped up to being a good band. I like most of the songs here. 8 out of 11 good songs. Granted, most of those are barely good, but they're still good. On to their next phase, the good alt-rock one, we get to 1997's Please Mr. Lost Man. This album starts with Stalker, which is immediately a huge departure from anything else the Pillows have ever released, outside of Kinda Killing Field. While the Pillows are mostly a chill pop band with some jazz touches, this throws that immediately out the window and throws some sick-ass alt-rock, which is what would make them famous. The Pillows still haven't developed their tight chaos yet, though. That would come later. This album is more focused on slowed down ballad -y type alt-rock songs, like Strange Chameleon and Ice Pick. This is a great transition into actual rock for the band, only held back by the fact that it kind of drags towards the end. I don't like the last two songs as much as the ones before them. 8 out of 10 on the good song meter. Finally, we've arrived at FLCL with 1998's Little Busters, and this is where the pillows really become great. Immediately, the first track blasts us into a new sound for them. Fast, upbeat, tightly written, power pop, bangers. This album contains some of the best songs in their entire discography. Hybrid Rainbow's chorus is towering and hits like a ton of bricks both the first and a thousandth time you've heard it. 
The little bit of vocal reverb on Blues Drive Monster adds such a cool dimension to that song that keeps me re-listening again and again. And Little Busters is a beautiful song that I hope they play at my graduation and every graduation ever. They really should. Even outside of the huge FLCL track, songs like Like a Love Song fill in the gaps to show that the pillows are super consistent. We get some more slowed down songs like Nowhere, which is reminiscent of Please Mr. Lost Man, and That House, which sounds like a much improved version of something that could have been on Moongold. 10 out of 11 good songs, with Black Sheep being, well, the Black Sheep on the album. It's a weird-ass, entirely acoustic track that doesn't work. Next up in their unstoppable run, we have 1999's Runner's High. This album starts incredibly strong. Sad Sad Kitty and Instant Music are both Pillows and FLCL classics. The album does kinda drop off a bit from there though. Of their peak albums, this is the most inconsistent. Brand New Love Song and the title track are obviously stellar in the later parts of this album, but the less rock tracks like Borderline, Case, and Paper Triangle just don't hit as much. There's still some surprise hitters on the album though in that section. White Ash is short but feisty, with some great shouting and stalker vibes. The song, that is. Wake Up Frenzy is also an underrated song in their discography with a tightly written chorus and a great loud, quiet dynamic between it and the verses. 10 out of 12 good songs, it's maybe the weakest of their peak, but it's still really good. Following that, also in 1999, we got Happy Bivac. This is their best album, and one of the best J-Rock albums in general. And one of the best albums in general. Yet again, the FLCL songs on here are obviously stellar. Beautiful Morning With You is, well, beautiful. Crazy Sunshine is a stellar chorus, and Carnival is super hype. This all pales in comparison to Last Dinosaur, which is like, my second favorite song of all time. The shoegaze elements and the screaming vocals and the oohs at the end are fucking unbelievable. This makes me feel things every time I can't express how much I love this song. This one is more like Little Busters in that even outside of the obvious hits, there's still some great stuff here. Backseat Dog is actually one of the best songs on the album, as it's super catchy with the great chorus, and the backing vocals help it to really stand out. By the way, how come Funny Bunny has like 10 times the amount of plays as the next song in this album on Spotify? I love that song, and it's also like the 7th best song on the record. That's how good this record is. 10 out of 11 on good songs, because Our Love and Peace is another weird slow song that I don't like too much. It would be good, but the vocals just get on my nerves. Following this is 2001 Smile. Yeah, there's an album between Happy Bivac and Thank You My Twilight. No one talks about it because it kinda sucks. Smile's a weird one in that it's their worst since Cool Spice and an unfortunate sign of things to come. The album starts out with two pretty good, if unambitious, songs. Like, the vocals just sound tired in comparison to their last couple records. The third song, All the Way to the Edge of the World, is really good though. It's the best song here, and also got ripped by AKFG and Haruka Kanata, I think. Like, listen to the opening of this song, and then the last 40 seconds or so of Haruka Kanata. It's the same riff. Unfortunately, after that, the good songs kinda go away. Like, it's fine and totally listenable, but there's nothing super fun or stand out to it at all. Fun, 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 okay is still good, but stuff like Skim Heaven and the title track are just passable, I guess. And Vain Dog is just bad. Also, whoever put this album on Spotify didn't think to separate the bonus track and Calvero, so Calvero just has like a minute and a half of silence in it for no reason. Oops. 4 out of 12 good songs, we've regressed. As I alluded to earlier, the next one is 2002's Thank You My Twilight. This album is pretty consistently solid, but it's a lot less ambitious than earlier records. It still has standout moments though, like on the title track and the song White Summer and Green Bicycle. Red Hair with Black Guitar, original egoistic version. I mean, those were the songs used in the FLCL remakes, but they're great. Biscuit Hammer is here, like Lucifer and Biscuit Hammer. Come On Ghost is a really underrated song. It's fun and tightly written. This might not be as ambitious as their peak, but it's still great, and it's definitely a rebound from Smile. It's 10 out of 11 good songs, only because I'm not big on the opener Rain Brain. Unfortunately, this is the end of an era, and that era is the good music era. <laughs> From here, we enter the waves of inconsistency. Like on their next album, 2003's Penalty Life. I honestly feel like you can tell they fell off just from looking at the cover of this album. What's even happening here? We start on Dead Stock Paradise, which is terrible, and insist on using this awful bell noise that just hurts my ears and gives me a headache. We rebound a little until we get to Terminal Heaven's Rock, which rivals Little Busters. It's a great song. It doesn't quite fit the nostalgia vibes from that and like Happy Bivac, but it's really awesome. Following this, we get three bad songs in a row. The album kind of recovers a little, but the songs that are barely good. Remember how they fucked up when they uploaded Smile? They did the same thing here. There's a five-minute bad closer 
a minute and a half of silence, and then three and a half more minutes of mid. Five out of 11 good songs. Throw that inconsistency out the window for just one second on 2004's Good Dreams, which is really good. Even from the start, you can tell this is going to be better than Penalty Life. Walking on the Spiral and Sono Mirai Wa Ima are instantly better than almost any song from that album. Sono Mirai Wa Ima also gets points for basically just being Last Dinosaur 2. Like, they put a dinosaur and a comet on the cover. They knew what they were doing. Lo-Fi Boy Fighter Girl is tightly written in a great time, and even their goofy instrumentals like Bad Dreams work really well. My only real problem with the album is the song Frontiers, which takes after Dead Stock Paradise by using a horrendous bell noise or something that just gives me a headache. Why would they do this? Does it not give them a headache? Why? Why? Outside of this, this album is pretty consistently fire, though. 10 out of 11 good songs. I am gonna have to spoil the rest of the list a bit here. It never gets this good again. We do get a bit more hope on 2006's My Foot, though. This album is pretty consistently good, but it isn't really great. We see a worrying trend start to form of the pillow's content with just being fine and not really striving for anything. This is with the exception of Rock and Roll Sinners though, which absolutely rips and is a great time. It's tightly written and is awesome. Outside of that, the pillows show that this could have been something really special if it was recorded like six years earlier. The ideas are solid and a lot of the tracks are really good, but the band never does anything to elevate them outside of just being merely good. Eight out of 11 good songs, but a lot of those are kind of barely good. It's still a good album overall, though. Unlike 2007's Wake Up, Wake Up, Wake Up, we are really starting to slide off the cliff now. First, look at this album cover. What is going on here? I could have made something that looks better than this in 10 minutes in MS Paint. And that's because they probably made this cover in 5 minutes in MS Paint. The more you look at this, the worse it gets. And you might think, oh, maybe it works better on a physical version. Well, let me tell you something. Right, so I have like 10 Pillows albums on CD. I've got ones we've already been over. I got Runner's High, Thank You My Twilight, My Foot, Please Mr. Lost Man, and regrettably, Wake Up, Wake Up, Wake Up. It looks like shit. Even on this physical copy that I have, for some reason, I don't know why I bought this, it still looks like shit. Like if you flip it over, this is a better album cover. Why did they not go with this? This is a better cover than what they went with on the front. I don't know. This is one of the worst album covers of all time. I'm, I'm sorry for this rant. Hell, they could have made this the album cover, and it would have been better. This is the liner insert. Anyways, onto the actual record that I'm here to review. It is terrible. We start on Wake Up Dodo, which is a really annoying and confusing chorus. Youngster Kent Arrow is pretty good, before we get four straight songs that range from mildly pleasant to complete mid. Following this, we have the band's worst song in their entire discography, Serious Plan. I cannot imagine how anyone thought this one was a good idea. The verses are nothing, and the chorus is just him whining, Serious Plan! Serious plan! Like 10 times in the most annoying voice ever. Why would they make this? The good news is there's three pretty good songs right at the end of the album here that kind of save this from being completely irredeemable. 4 out of 11 on the good songs scale, which is just depressing. Following this, they came back the next year with 2008's Pied Piper. And this is an improvement. There's definitely some good stuff here. No Surrender is the kind of tight rock song that was just completely absent on something like their last record. It's definitely one of the best songs of this era. We also see some experimentation going on on tracks like Tokyo Bambi, which is just a really bizarre song for them to make. Between the trippy breakbeat and the trumpets, it's not something I would ever expect out of the pillows. Overall, the album is fine. There's some solid stuff here on tracks like Lady World Girl and New Animal, but there's still some mid lying around when it comes to tracks like Across the Metropolis. 7 out of 11 good songs. After this album, we unfortunately enter a phase that I like to call the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There are some terrible albums in here, like 2009's Oop Arts. I own this one too. I don't think I could give this away. This album sucks. And again, cover art, ignore the rental CD sticker there is horrible. The back cover looks better. Both the liner art and the CD look better. Why? Why did they do this? The top review of this album on Rate Your Music says, take the art out of Oop Arts and what are you left with? Yeah, a lot of my issues with the pillows have to do with their ballad -y tracks. They did a lot of these in this era, and they were pretty much always boring. They're really prevalent on something like Wake Up, and they only exist to pad the runtime and do nothing. This album doesn't actually have many of those. These songs are, for the most part, trying to be alt-rock bangers, 
and failing miserably. Your order and lemon drops are both barely good. Barely. The pillows feel like they're not trying. These are songs that would have gone crazy years ago, but are now barely passable. There's just so many bizarre decisions here, like Dance With God sounding like a second-rate blues drive monster, or the entire second half of the album, or Beyond the Moon being six and a half minutes long and doing absolutely nothing for most of its runtime, or them naming a song Life Size Life, The Bag Is Small and I Don't Enter. Would you believe me when I tell you that song isn't good? Primer Beat is on some swing shit and it sucks. Life Size Life is some bizarre English lyrics about, I think, love. I have no idea. Foxes is absolutely horrible songwriting and a terrible chorus. And why is there a xylophone? There's just so much shit here that doesn't work. I'm sad. Two out of 11 good songs. The sadness continues on 2011's Horn Again. I can't. I can't do this anymore. Horn Again. Horn again, because it's got horns. You know, when you're trying to make a pun on like Born Again, you think it might be like your first album in a long time or something that sounds completely different from the rest of your discography or a new era for the band. This is none of those. This is their worst record. What are you birthing again? Shit music? It's just because it's got horns on the album cover. It's not even the instrument horns, because there aren't any on this record. The first song is called Limp Tomorrow, which is really on point. Give me up! I have. We get a really solid mix on this album between bad ballady songs and unbelievably lethargic attempts at alt-rock. The pillows sound fucking asleep at the wheel. No one involved in this sounds like they actually wanted to make music. At least Ubart sounded like they were enjoying themselves. Even the recording quality on this album is bad. Like, Moon Gold from 1991 was recorded better than this. What happened here? The guitar sounds like ass. The drums are almost never interesting. The vocals just sound tired. He sounds like he's sleepwalking through these songs. Tracks like Lily My Son sound like entries in a contest to make the least interesting song possible. There's not even a lot to say about these songs because it's just boring. Boring. Sounds like shit. Boring and sounds like shit. I don't want to go on. One out of 11 good songs. I'm still sad. We do get a brief intermission from the sadness, though. On 2012's Trial, this album is kind of inconsistent, but there's definitely more good songs here. The album starts kind of slow with Comic Sonic and Flashback Story, which are boring, but by the end, it's a fairly good time. Minority Whisper is awesome, the title track is good, and Ready Steady Go is a fun closer. In the whole picture of their discography, this album is fine, I guess. In comparison to the albums that come right before and after this, I'm not sure they could have done any better. This album gets credit because at least the not good songs are still kind of interesting and are still decent to listen to, unlike on a lot of other albums. It's 5 out of 10 good songs, but some progress was made here. And also, the album cover is actually good this time. Progress was not made on 2014's Moon Dust, however. Yet again, terrible album cover, better back cover. What's interesting is that the first four songs on this record are actually really good. Alice in the City and Clean Slate Revolution are both really fun bangers. The issue is that those are the only good songs on the album. After that, we immediately go into some really shitty ballad tracks like on Happy Birthday before dropping off the cliff entirely. Anemone is super bland, Song For You sounds like ass, and the title track is both. Yeah, they named a song on this record Song For You. Creativity is dead. I'm surprised they didn't just call it Song. Now, the Pillows don't release EPs. They've released one in the last 30 years, and it was a self-covers EP. With that said, this absolutely should have been an EP. Take those first four songs, release those, and it would be their most consistent body of work in a decade. Unfortunately, there are seven other songs on this album. Four out of 11 good songs. Next up, we're starting to get pretty recent on 2016's Stroll and Roll. Actual good album cover this time, although I'm still kind of impartial to the back cover. I think this is pretty funny. This is another where the first song, Debris, is really good. The closer, Locomotion More and More, is a catchy song and is a great time. Sadly, this album does have a middle where there are no good songs. There's not even any songs that are really close to good songs. Sometimes it's sounding boring and generic like on Radio Telegraphy. Sometimes it's just outright bad songwriting like on I Riot, but there's not a lot here in the middle. The good thing about this album is that they seem to have worked out their recording issues. Yeah, the last three albums all sounded terrible like that. You can actually hear everything at a somewhat reasonable level here. There's not that much on this album I'd actually want to hear, but you know, it sounds better now at least. Two out of ten good songs. 
Now we enter our last phase, looking up. There's only two albums left, so they didn't get long to look up, but they did. 2017's Nook in the Brain is their shortest effort since Cool Spice over 20 years ago. It clocks in at just over 30 minutes and it's tight. The bar has definitely been raised here. There's a lot less outright bad songs. The stupid ballad tracks are gone and replaced with fun hooks, and there's lots of energy. And just like Trial, even the songs that aren't good are at least pleasant and decently listenable. The pillows on this album finally have some energy to them. They sound like they're having a great time. They sound like they want to be here. The guitars and vocals have greatly improved from albums past. My main issue here is that the middle section isn't as good as the beginning and end of the album though. There's some fine songs there like Perfect Idea, but nothing I'd really want to come back to. I do want to highlight the last song here, Where Do I Go? I had the stupidest grin on my face when I first listened to this. The album felt like such a breath of fresh air and this was just the icing on the cake. The manic energy that I'd been missing since Happy Bevac was finally back and it felt so good. 5 out of 10 good songs, but so much progress was made on this. And now their last album, 2018's Rebroadcast. This is their best since 2004. We start with a bang. The title track is everything I want in a pillow song. Fun, great chorus, energetic. It's awesome. There's a lot of great tracks here. Even the ballads are good. Tracks three and six are genuinely really fun, interesting songs that are worth their runtime and their best ballad tracks in like two decades now. Boon Boon Rock is awesome too. You remember Lo-Fi Boy Fighter Girl from 2004? This is a sequel of sorts to that. It's that song, but with real powerful energy. The chorus is so good, and the closer before going to bed is loaded with distortion and sounds so different for them, but it works. It's a heartfelt song in English about seizing life and how music helped them move forwards. There's also a part, again in English, where he just yells, Thanks to my bitch, and I think that's really funny. I'm gonna lead off by saying this is 6 out of 10 good songs, but just like Nook in the Brain, even the weaker ones are still plenty decent. For example, if I'm saying that a good song is something like an 8 out of 10 or above, there's nothing here below a 7. This is a good album, and I'm glad they went out on a high note. And that's where we are now. They haven't released any studio albums since. There's been some releases, like an anime single, and they're still frequently playing concerts, but nothing really in terms of new music. They're probably going to come back again for some FLCL stuff in 2023, but who knows if a new album or anything is actually going to come for that, or if it's just more re-recordings of old songs. If rebroadcast is it for them, I'll be satisfied. I love the pillows, if you can't tell by the fact that I did this and then made an entire video on it. Uh, I hope their next album is good if they do one. I hope they have a good life in retirement if they don't. Subscribe, comment, like... Uh, I'm trying to go to college and I need money. Bye.